Too loud, too loud. <laughs> or maybe that's just from the computer. Okay. Okay, so we can begin. We could do three mental bows to the Buddha. One, two, three. And then I will do the homage, one time the homage. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Okay, so good morning, everybody. And today is August 12th, 2023. So we are moving through the summer. The summer goes, goes so quickly. You know? Just seems like we just started. We were in June, and now already it's August, coming closer to Labor Day. Then it'll be winter, then spring, then another summer. <laughs> okay. Okay, so now we're jumping through the Anguttara Nikaya. I'm trying to pick out the suttas that are of general interest. Anybody coming from an Indian background might be interested in a couple of suttas that I skipped over, but they're not so relevant to us in the United States, or at least in most parts. But in this chapter, there are the first two suttas are really pretty, I have to say, almost savage attacks against the, some of the Brahmins by the Buddha. Okay, and this sutta also features a dialogue between the Buddha and a Brahmin. So the whole chapter involves discourses involving Brahmins, and this Brahmin is named Sangharava. And the theme of the sutta, as we'll see, will be the five hindrances and the obstructive impact of the five hindrances on the mind. And usually we find the Buddha introducing the five hindrances in the sequence of the, what I call the sequential development of the past, which I dealt with a section on the five hindrances, I think it was just last week, or actually, or actually two months ago, in my series of talks to the Russian-speaking group, where we're doing the sutta on the elephant's footprint, where the Buddha explains the gradual development of the disciples through the different stages of training. And one stage is the overcoming the abandoning of the five hindrances as the preliminary to the attainment of the absorptions, the jhanas. But here the Buddha is going to introduce the five hindrances in a somewhat different framework involving a matter of concern to the Brahmins. And so here this Brahmin Sangharava comes to the Buddha and after some cordial introductory talk, he says, why is it that sometimes even those hymns that have been recited over a long period do not recur to the mind, let alone those that have not been re so recited? Why is it that sometimes even those hymns that have not been recited over a long period of time recur to the mind, let alone those that have been so excited. So the sutta is in effect asking a, no, I just saw some message flash up. I'm just, is my voice coming through okay without any screen? Not, not here, but for the people online. But sometimes the microphone gets rubbed. You're fine now. Pretty uh, good. Yes, good. Bhante, we can hear you. Yes, we hear you well, Bhante. Yes, we can hear you fine. Thanks, Bhante. No, no static sound. No. It's good. It's good. Thank you. Mute. 
Oh, okay. Okay, so the question is asking, in effect, what is it that enables sometimes the memory to be very sharp and clear so that we can remember things that had occurred long ago? And why is it that we sometimes forget things, even things that happened just recently? So the Brahman is concerned about the hymns, or these are actually the mantras, the Vedic hymns, but we can be concerned with other matters. Why do some, sometimes we have very clear, strong memory, and sometimes the memory is weak? And then the Buddha is going to answer by way of the five hindrances. First, we just take before I go into the individual explanation of the hindrances, we just take the first answer as a kind of template. <clears throat> so he says, when one dwells with a mind obsessed and oppressed by sensual lust, this is the first hindrance, in this case, Kamaraga, and one does not understand correctly the escape from arisen sensual lust. On that occasion, one does not know and see as it really is one's own good, the good of others, and the good of both. You can see the Buddha broadens his approach to the question. So he's not confining it narrowly to the question of memory, but he's broadening it to an understanding of what is truly beneficial to oneself, beneficial to others, beneficial to both. And then he says, then even those hymns that have been recited over a long period do not recur to the mind, let alone those that have not been so recited. And so the, and then the same thing is repeated in different ways and regarding the other four hindrances. So the point here is, at least with regard to the question of the Brahman, that it's when the mind is covered over by the five hindrances that memory is weakened so that one doesn't remember things even that occurred recently, let alone things that have occurred a long time ago. Um, I have to say I'm not so sure <laughs> actually that a mind covered by the five hindrances is actually necessarily inevitably weakened in its memory. I was just thinking as I was reflecting on the sutta, I don't know if the name Karl Rove rings a bell with anybody. No? Well, Karl Rove it's, was yes. was the advisor to President George W. Bush. This was during the period from 2002, 2000 to 2008. George W. Bush was the president, and Karl Rove was his kind of campaign strategist and advisor. And it's said that Karl Rove had almost like a photographic memory because when he came up, there was a kind of hearing in which they were investigating corruption in the Bush administration. And when Karl Rove was called up for interrogation, he would keep on saying, oh, I don't remember this. I don't remember that. <laughs> but the people who knew him said, Karl Rove will not even forget what flavor tea he might have had on the Thursday three weeks ago. <laughs> His memory was so sharp. And I don't think that he had a mind that was free from the five hindrances, <laughs> at least from the Buddhist perspective. But in any case, I think that certainly you could say that to the degree that the mind is freed from this, say, the clouding by lust, ill will, drowsiness, restlessness, and doubt, 
To that extent, I would say the memory would certainly be sharpened and strengthened. So certainly we should, even if we have no other objective in mind but to improve our memory, <laughs> we should make an effort to at least weaken the grip of the five hindrances. And as far as things like reciting the hymns, I know that there are like monks in, particularly in Myanmar, who are not maybe really like specialists in meditation, who are necessarily attainers of the jhanas, but maybe because they have been brought up as monks from very early age, so the mind is relatively free from exposure to the hindrances. And so they're able, some of them are able to memorize whole Nikayas, probably the ones who can memorize a whole Nikaya are a dime a dozen, very, very common. Some can memorize an entire Pitaka, like a whole Sutta Pitaka, whole Vinaya Pitaka, whole Abhidhamma Pitaka. And there have been a few who can memorize, who have memorized, at least who are credited with memorizing the entire Tripitaka, all three baskets. Of course, it's difficult for anybody to test them because if you say, okay, Venerable, we're going to test you to find out whether you've really memorized the entire Tripitaka. Okay, you start off from the Diga Nikaya. And so we'll start from the beginning of the Diga Nikaya, but who's going to sit with him <laughs> day after day to see whether he gets through the last book of the Abhidhamma Bhitaka. So the way they test them is they'll call them up and then at random they'll choose a book from the, someplace from the Pali Canon, and then they'll recite a few lines of text so that they get, the candidate gets an idea of what is the passage that they're referring to? So they'll recite a few lines and then they'll say to him, okay, you pick it up from here. And if he can pick it up from there, then at least they have, at least they give him one mark, one check mark. If he can't follow through, they say, okay, there's the door, get out. <laughs> get out, venerable sir. <laughs> okay, then after he passes the first, test, then they'll choose another passage, maybe from a different collection, and say, okay, pick it up and continue from there, then he has to continue from there. And that way they'll test him maybe 20, 25 passages chosen at random, and if he could pass all of them, then at least they'll take his word for it that he has memorized the entire Pali Canon. Okay, but the Buddha, you could say that he's not concerned only with the process of improving one's memory, but the Buddha sort of underscores what is really pointing to the aim of his teaching, to be able to see as it really is one's own good, the good of others and the good of both. Yeah, I had a note on the commentary, which I think gives a rather as is typical for commentaries, they give a rather narrow interpretation, sort of based perhaps from what I would call their cloistered, <laughs> cloistered monastic perspective. So the commentary says, one's own good is the attainment of our hardship. The good of others is the welfare of the lay supporters who provide the monk with the material support, and then the good of both, of course, will be both aims, one's own attainment of our hardship and the attainment of merit by those who make the offerings. But I think we have to understand, interpret this idea of one's own good, the good of others, and the good of both in a very broad sense, not taking it in rather this narrow monastic sense. So that one's own good, one has to understand what is going to contribute, say, to one's own moral and spiritual 
progress, or maybe even achieving one's own material well-being, though not in a rather narrow way driven by greed and ambition, but when one has to achieve some degree of material security, and one also has to look after the material security of others who would be within one's range of responsibility, family members, friends, colleagues, and so forth, one wants to ensure their material good, and the good of both takes both into account, but also one wants to broaden the range beyond the focus on material security and see what is going to be conducive to the moral and spiritual benefit of oneself and others that one can influence. And so it's just not just that one is narrowly focused immediately on our hardship for oneself and others, but how one could help others to understand the need, say, to make ethical decisions, and even to affect, I would say, in our current sort of social and political system, how to use our moral judgment in making decisions that are going to affect our society, our world. Like now we're facing this most dreadful catastrophic climate crisis, which is just escalating year after year and spreading around the world. So in, like, in the southern states of this country, Texas, Arizona, people have been experiencing weather or temperatures going up into the hundreds day after day after day. And yet there are organizations in this country which are trying to propagate the belief and even the Republicans in Congress also supporting this idea that this is just the natural fluctuation of the weather. It's summertime and summertime you have hot weather, heavier rain. So this is just purely natural. There's nothing we can do about it. So if we're really concerned with our own good in this situation, the good of others, we have to take action. At least we have to support candidates that are going to promote responsible climate policies rather than those that are going to be deniers and just um, promoting policies that serve the interests of fossil fuel corporations. Okay, so it's when the mind is sort of oppressed, and you can see when the mind is oppressed by maybe not just, we just won't take sensual lust just in the narrow sense, but let's say when the mind is overcome by greed and selfishness, then one will make decisions that are ultimately, they might seem to promote one's own good, because when you're acting on the motivation of greed, ambition, selfishness, then one will choose courses of action that seem to lead to one's material benefit. But in the long run, they'll be harmful to oneself, even if you get material well-being, but they can be morally and spiritually harmful to yourself, and certainly harmful, harmful to others and harmful to both. And so if we're going to form accurate judgments, judgments that are conducive to our own benefit, the benefit of others, the benefit of both, we need a mind free from these five mental hindrances. Okay, let us now, first we'll go through the sutta, then we'll focus more on the role of the five hindrances in the framework of the Buddha's teaching. Okay, so we have the first hindrance is sensual lust, kama raga. And then we have this illustrated, the Buddha uses in the case of each hindrance, he uses a simile involving water. And I find that one of the most impressive features in my way of thinking, especially when I first read the Pali Canon, were the similes, the brilliance of the mind that composed these texts in using very, very effective similes to and simple similes to illustrate each of these points.
Okay, so here we have the simile of a bowl of water. And the bowl of water is mixed with different colored substances, different kinds of dye, black, I think lac, I think it's a kind of dark red. Anybody know what lac is? I should have looked this up before the class. <laughs> I think it's a kind of scarlet red dye. Okay, then turmeric, actually turmeric is pretty much this color, kind of uh, copper brown, a blue dye, and then a crimson dye. Crimson is a dark red. So we have the bowl of water mixed with these different colored substances. And then we have a person with good sight and he looks into the bowl of water in order to see his own reflection in it. And the reflection would not be very clear, not very accurate. So if you look into the bowl of water, I uh, white skin, but I look into the bowl of water and I see an image in which there are streaks of dark red, streaks of blue, streaks of yellow, of a kind of dark yellow, streaks of crimson. So I'm not seeing an accurate reflection of my face. So it's a distorted image of my face. And so this illustrates the nature of sensual craving, sensual lust, when it overpowers the mind. Because sensual lust, it's in a way something which is bright and colorful and attractive, just like these different colored dyes. So you think of beautiful forms, lovely sounds, lovely shapes, lovely fragrances, delicious tastes the objects of sensual lust. So that's beautiful, wonderful, enticing, but it distorts our understanding, distorts our way of perceiving things and interpreting things. And so things that are really, when you plunge into them and try to grasp them and take possession of them, they turn out to be sources of misery and <laughs> misery and suffering but on the surface they have the sparkling attractive appearance deceptively attractive appearance so also we find sensual lust illustrated by the figure of mara so mara in buddhism it's a little bit different from the devil in christianity the devil appears with horns and the rough beard and flames coming out of the body, a rather frightening image, a long tail. And so when you see the devil, then you get terrified. <laughs> but Mara appears in Buddhism like a beautiful, handsome youth, usually like a young man, because he's going to especially in a number of suttas, he comes up to the bhikkhunis, the nuns, and tries to entice them into cavorting with him in the mango grove or the flower grove and in order to enjoy sensual pleasures. <laughs> but the nuns being bhikkhunis, arhats, they can see through him and then they, they expose his ruse. Okay, so this is the first hindrance, the hindrance of sensual lust, illustrated by the simile of the bowl of water, which is mixed with these different colored dyes. Okay, the next hindrance is the hindrance of ill will. Oh, uh, yeah, I passed too quickly over an important, we'll come back to this. We'll come back to the escape from the five hindrances. Okay, the next hindrance is ill will. And this can cover things, states like anger, 
resentment, hatred, displeasure, annoyance, maybe connected with jealousy, envy, and so on. Okay, so this is also an obstacle to knowing and seeing one's own good. Because if when you see, when you get, the mind gets overcome by anger, by ill will, you can explode in ways with angry speech, with violent action, that are going to damage your relationships with, with, other, <laughs> with other people, particularly in family life. You know, if the husband bears ill will towards his wife and then speaks to her, it doesn't have to be with harsh, violent speech, but sometimes it could just be with subtle words of sarcasm, putting her down in ways with sharp speech, caustic speech that cuts into the heart. Or if the parents speak to the children in that way, that the children feel really hurt and it can lead to kind of dejection in the children. So the children could feel, grow up feeling worthless and that their lives are meaningless. So in this country, we have like such a spate. I just saw the headlines or report the other day that over this past year, the suicide rate has just increased, I think, 12% over the last year. And probably this comes about through the explosions of violence in this country, violent speech, the polarization of the country, the way the different political parties demonize the other party. And I have to say, it's not really bipolar in that respect. It's really one party, I have to say, the Republican Party, demonizing, trying to marginalize the Democratic Party. The Democrats, I have to say, are too soft, too polite. They don't fight back strongly enough. I'm not a member of either party, but I, I'm just an observer. Okay, so, and then you can see on a larger scale when anger, ill will spreads amongst individuals and unites people together, then it leads to even like violent social conflict, the violence of racism, mobilization of certain racial groups against other racial groups, or the mobilization, say, of the, what is he, what is he, those who were born in the United States against immigrants, so immigrants coming from Central America, South America, Mexico, oh, they can't be real Americans, they don't belong here, here. Those coming from Asia don't belong here, go back to your own country. So it leads to this kind of damaging social conflict and at the worst it erupts into, into wars, wars of aggression, wars of conquest. And then so many people get killed, injured, People lose family members, their own homes, like what's going on in Eastern Europe now, just day after day, bombardment especially. The Russian rockets hitting Ukraine, just hitting towns and cities, and just ordinary citizens losing their homes, their whole villages and towns destroyed. All of that coming from ill will. Okay, then to illustrate ill will, we have the simile. So here we have the, again, it's the bowl of water, but this time the bowl of water has been heated over a fire, so it's bubbling and boiling. So this is like the mind overcome by ill will and anger. It's, you could say that the mind is boiling with anger. It's bubbling with anger. Of course, bubbling could also indicate joy and happiness. Mind bubbling with happiness and joy, or bubbling with, <laughs> with metta, with loving kindness. But this is bubbling and boiling with hatred and ill will. And then again, if a person 
what you look to see, their reflection, their facial reflection, and the bubbling boil of bubbling bowl of water, they would not be able to see, to get an accurate ref reflection, to see an accurate reflection of their face. So that illustrates ill will. Okay, then we have the third hindrance, and this is really particularly key to meditation practice. This is, we call this dullness and drowsiness. As we'll see, there are actually two separate mental factors joined here, which are joined because they have the effect of, you can say the combined effect of impeding the mind or pulling the mind down. So one is called dullness, the other is drowsiness. We're going to come to a, the analysis which distinguishes them, but now we'll just treat them together. Like as the sutta does, is one hindrance. And so this is like the, it has the effect of making the mind heavy stiff and rigid and drowsy. Not the normal drowsiness that comes when at night when you're reaching your bedtime, but this is the kind of heaviness and sleepiness that can set in even during the middle of the day, even early in the morning when you get up. And then if you sit for meditation, you had a good night's sleep. But then after 20 minutes, kind of drowsiness sets in. And so this is illustrated by the bowl of water covered with algae and various water plants. So it's a kind of obstruction or of the surface of the water. So the algae grow in the water and then the water is, becomes obscured. So if you try to examine your own facial reflection, you can't get an accurate picture of it. Because the water is all covered with, with algae. Yeah, we have that problem with this lake here, especially during the hot period of the summer. And you see that there's a lot of algae appears over the surface. And, well, I don't try to see my facial reflection in the lake. <laughs> but you can't really see even the reflection of the trees leaning over the lake don't appear very clearly because of the algae. Okay, then the fourth hindrance, again, it's two factors that are joined together, restlessness and remorse. And the two are joined together because they both have the effect of causing some kind of agitation in the mind. So the third hindrance, dullness and drowsiness, pulls the mind down, and restlessness and remorse maybe pushes the mind up, not in a positive way, but it excites, they both have the factor of exciting or agitating the mind. And again, this is a kind of hindrance particular to the meditation practice. But actually, it also covers into everyday life so that if your mind is always agitated, restless, overcome by this agitation, then you can't form good decisions, reliable decisions about what is going to be beneficial to yourself or beneficial to others. Because the mind, so often you have to focus on something to consider something closely, carefully, accurately, consider the different nuances, the implications, the consequences, short-term consequences, long-term consequences. But if the mind is overcome by restlessness, sometimes you just jump to a quick decision, almost a spontaneous decision, you know, triggered by some immediate desire. And then, because you didn't consider 
have the chance to consider the long range consequences, then when the full consequences of your decision unfold, you feel it can bring harm to yourself and others. So for this reason, you have to make your decisions with a calm, collected, focused mind. And then here the Buddha illustrates this with the simile of a bowl of water, which is start, something is causing, is that coming from my microphone? I did, okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, please be sure that you keep muted people online. Okay, so the Buddha illustrates this with the simile of a bowl of water that is being stirred by the wind. So we have a strong wind blowing over the water. So the water is whipped up into ripples, swirling, churned into wavelets. So again, you try to see your reflection and you just see your face is just broken up into little fragments of the image. So you can't get a good picture of the face. Okay, then we come to the fifth hindrance. The hindrance is doubt. And again, with doubt, you don't understand your own good, the good of others. And then the illustration. So this is a bowl of water that is cloudy, turbid, and muddy, and placed in the dark, in a dark place. And so it's placed maybe in a closet, and you go into that closet, in order to see your image and the water itself is muddy and you look and you can't get a good image of your face. Okay, now what I want to do is to take a closer look at the five hindrances individually. Let me increase the size of this. Yeah, one of the strengths of the Pali Buddhist tradition is that we find this it was one of the methods taken up by the ancient, ancient teachers is to give very sort of precise definitions of important technical terms in the used in the suttas. And so this is a text, it's from the Abhidhamma Bhitaka, the text called the Dhamma Sangani, which is the definition of Dhammas, of the factors. And here we have definitions of the five hindrances. I just took the Pali text and I'll just do an on the spot partial translation. Okay, so it raises the question, what is the hindrance of Kama Chanda, sensual desire. And so it says, in regard to objects of sensual pleasure, sens it uses a string of similes, sensual desire, sensual lust, sensual delight, sensual craving, sensual affection, sensual, the fever of sensuality, the infatuation of sensuality, the clinging to sensual pleasures. So that is the hindrance of sensual desire. Yeah, so you can see that it's not simply craving in the broad sense, but it's specifically the craving, desire, or lust for sensual pleasures, the enjoyment of the senses. 
Okay, then we have the hindrance of ill will. And again, we have the definition by way of a string of simile, uh, of synonyms. And we have so many terms that it's difficult to translate into English because we lack an adequate number of English terms to render all of these poly terms. But I just will try. So what is the, let's say the mental resentment, um, aversion, hostility, irritation, annoyance, stronger irritation, hatred, um, of explosive hatred, straightened hatred, ill will, mental hatred, anger, getting angry, bearing anger, again, hatred, hating, hatefulness, and so on. Hostility, ferocity, <laughs> displeasure of the mind. So those are a number of synonyms for ill will to bring out the meaning. Okay, then we come to this combined hindrance, the third hindrance, tina mida, which I translate as dullness and drowsiness. Some early translators used to use sloth and torpor, which maybe I don't think is so accurate. So for tina, let's get some useful ones. Okay, I would take this as the laxity of the mind, the sluggishness of the mind, the stiffness of the mind, rigidity of the mind, heaviness of the mind. And then midda, what we translate as drowsiness. So we could say, yeah, so, so we could say sleepiness, a dozing off, um, various terms meaning sleep, sleepiness, drowsiness, dullness, uh, drowsiness, dullness, drowsiness, sleepiness, dozing off. We have a number of terms with similar meaning. Okay, so they're combined because they both have the nature of being sluggish states of mind, states of mind that I say pull the mind down. And then the fourth hindrance is also combined. So we have udacha kukucha. So it says that this, here we have udacha and we have kukucha, two separate factors. So what is udacha? So it is lack of peacefulness of the mind a kind of agitation of the mind, the wandering or roaming of the mind. So this is a dacha. And kukucha, kukucha we can say is, okay, kukucha is regret, regretfulness, regretting a um, remorse, mental remorse, a scratching of the mind. And it comes about when you do something wrong uh, or and you, you do something wrong that you something that you should not have done, you do, and something that you should have done, you have failed to do. So in both those cases, there comes this regret, remorse, a scratching of the mind, the kind of inner displeasure as you recollect your faults of omission and commission. Okay, then comes the hindrance of doubt. So here it just enumerates different aspects of doubt. So when doubts, the teacher- Very bad sound. Bhante, your mic is Bante. not clear. There's some kind of a disturbance as you speak. How about now? Okay, you sounded good now. Let me readjust the mic. Okay.
Okay, how is it now? Okay, it's okay now. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you for. for thank you, Bhante. Okay, so we have the hindrance of doubt. And so here we have an enumeration of different objects of doubt. So it uses two words for doubt. So we say doubt, one has doubt and uncertainty about the teacher. The teacher is the Buddha. It's not referring to the, to the ordinary teacher, but Satari means specifically the Buddha as the, as the teacher. One has doubt about the Dhamma, the teaching, doubt about the Sangha, this would be the Aryan Sangha, doubt about the training or the practice, then these are really the main types of doubt and the secondary doubts, doubts about the past, about the future, about the past and future combined. And then doubt about conditionality and dependently originated dhammas. And then it gives various synonyms for doubt. Okay, so that takes us through an analysis, analytical explanation of the five hindrances. Now we come to an important section on the, sub, the subtitle of the section is why the hymns are remembered but that's really of secondary importance. What's of primary importance is how one knows and sees as it really is, one's own good, the good of others, and the good of both. And here, first, one has to have the mind that's not obsessed and oppressed by the five hindrances, but one has to know, to understand as it really is, the escape or the release from the five hindrances. Yeah, so that is an important point, is to know, to know and understand how, what are the antidotes to the five hindrances. And I compiled another text. We'll take a quick look at it, which shows us the standard ways that the sutta propose that the suttas propose for overcoming the five hindrances okay it's, do you see the word file that i just put up yes okay. yes but... okay so this is teaching the first the things that contribute to the strengthening of the five hindrances so this, these are called the nutriments the nutriment for the arising of unarisen sensual desire and for the increase and expansion of sensual desire. So this is the same as sensual lust or sensual, yeah. So first there is what's called the sign of the beautiful. So this means the beautiful and attractive appearances of things. And since this teaching is usually given in relation to the monastic training, what is <laughs> pretty much meant by the sign of the beautiful would be the sign of a sexually attractive object. Because with the training of monks and nuns, the important task is to overcome, to gradually weaken and overcome sexual desire, sexual craving. And so when the mind attends to the bodies of members of the opposite sex, or could be even the same sex, as being beautiful and attractive, and then focuses on that appearance and dwells on it, giving careless or superficial attention to it. That is what stimulates the arising of 
new sensual desire and causes arisen sensual desire to become stronger. Okay, maybe we'll do the one by one, we do the antidotes. First, we do the nutriments and then the antidotes for each one, one by one. Okay, so what is the method of debilitating, of weakening, of preventing sensual desire from arising and for weakening the arisen, the arisen sensual desire? This is called the, de, the method of denourishing, or we could say of starving, <laughs> starving the hindrances. Okay, so here the text says there is Maybe I don't like this translation so much anymore. It's the sign of foulness. So it's, the Pali is asuba, which means simply the sign of the non-beautiful or the sign of the unattractive. And so this is, comes to refer to the particular meditative practice of contemplating the parts of the body the usually we have the list of 32 parts which includes various tissues organs and fluids of the body and one runs through them methodically as a kind of systematic meditation practice to penetrate through the attractive appearance of the body and then to see how what we think of as a beautiful, attractive body is really a combination, an amalgamation of tissues, organs, fluids, which you look at them part by part, they're not beautiful. And so when you do this, then it helps to remove the sensual desire that's arisen and helps to prevent the arising of sensual desire in the future. So that is the antidote to the hindrance of sensual desire. Okay, then we have the hindrance of ill will. So what is the cause for the arising of ill will, for strengthening ill will? It's said to be the sign of the repulsive. I think it's the Pali, it's the Patiga Nimitta. So it's an object that somehow provokes ill will, resentment, displeasure, aversion. Could be like, say there's a person that you find a little bit annoying and irritating, and maybe it's a way that person maybe the way they walk that troubles you, or the sound of their voice, or just their gestures, or just even the facial features. And so when the mind focuses upon that thing that's, that provokes anger and ill will, that is what causes the ill will to arise and to become stronger. And you keep on, or maybe it could be the, some bad deeds, some harmful deeds that that person did to you in the past. And that will cause, when you keep on dwelling on those thoughts, those unpleasant memories, giving careless attention to them, that strengthens the ill will and causes it to, ex to expand. And so what is the antidote to that? The denourishment for ill will. It is the liberation of the mind through loving kindness. So this is metta, metta ceto vimuti. And usually we don't begin with the person who causes us ill will or aversion, but you start off with people that are agreeable, with friends, close and beloved family members, then you move to neutral people then you can focus on the irritating or annoying person. And so when you develop the mind of loving kindness, or it could even be the mind of compassion, then that will 
help to remove ill will. Okay, then the cause for sloth and torpor, or what I now call dullness and drowsiness. Yeah, I have to say it's not really <laughs> that helpful, the sutta. So it says there's discontent, lethargy, lazy stretching, drowsiness after meals, sluggishness of mind, giving careless attention to that is the cause for the arising of arisen, unarisen thought and torpor and for them to increase. But let's see the antidote. Yeah, the antidote that says is the element of arousal, the element of endeavor, the element of exertion. So these are actually three stages in developing virya or energy. So first, you have to arouse energy. So when you're getting, when the mind is getting dull and drowsy and sleepy, what you have to do is to arouse energy. And one method that's mentioned, not here, but in other suttas, is for getting rid of dullness and drowsiness is called the perception of light. So that is you do the meditation, you take as a meditation object, a bright light. It could be the light of a full moon, it could be the light of the disk of the sun, but don't stare at the sun to get that image. And you can just look just for a split second at the sun during the middle of the day, get the image of the sun, and then focus meditatively on the sunlight with your mind's eye. And then the brightness of that light will help to dispel dullness and drowsiness. Another method that is recommended is to do the walking meditation. So first you arouse energy. The second stage is you persist in that endeavor. And then the third stage is the stage where the energy becomes so strong that it can't be overcome by dullness and drowsiness. Okay, so I'm going rather quickly through these, so we have some time for questions. Okay, the fourth hindrance is the hindrance of restlessness and remorse. And so the nutriment for that is unsettledness of mind, and frequently giving careless attention to that is what causes this restlessness and remorse to increase. So there could be things that cause some disturbance of the mind, some agitation. And if you keep on dwelling on those things, then the restlessness becomes stronger and more dominant. So the way, sort of the antidote to that restlessness is said to be peacefulness of mind. Easier said than done. But usually what is recommended to overcome the restlessness and remorse is a simple meditation object that allows you to collect and concentrate the mind. So it's usually recommended as the direct antidote to restlessness is mindfulness of breathing. Let's say you have something very simple, always present, and you just let the thoughts go their own way. You know, let them come and let them go. They will continue, but you don't latch onto them. And you just bring the mind back again and again, mindfully to the breath, until when the mind becomes well settled on the breath, then the restlessness and remorse will go. And then it said, the nutriment for doubt is that there are things that are the basis for doubt, frequently giving careless attention to them is the nutriment that increases doubt. And then it said the antidote for doubt is 
has said that there are wholesome and unwholesome states, blamable and blameless states, and so on. Frequently giving careful attention to them is the nutriment that prevents doubt from arising and becoming stronger. So this is for somebody who is not sure what is good, what is bad, what is helpful, what is harmful, what is a, supports one's practice, what is a hindrance to one's practice. So being able to distinguish those states is what helps to overcome doubt. So this is what the sutta says. What I say, my own answer to that method for overcoming doubt is when doubts arise, just put them in brackets and just go on with one's practice, not being pulled aside by doubts, just seeing doubt as sort of the work of Mara trying to distract you. At other times outside meditation practice, then you can try to clarify doubts by study, by raising questions, by personal investigation. But when you're doing practice and doubts arise, just don't latch on to them. Just treat them as states of mind that arise and then drop them and go back to one's primary object. Okay, I wanted to leave some time for questions, so let us see if we can always give priority to people who are, took the trouble to come to the class. So anybody here? Okay. Um, my question is about laxity. It, I'm not sure if they're two different words, but I always understood lax to be loose. Uh, when rules are lax, they're not very strong. And um, lax behavior is usually kind of careless and thoughtless, like yeah. loose, but it's often described in conjunction with rigidity and tightness when I'm talking about dullness. I see, I see. I see. And I'm just wondering if you could clarify, are we to accept both of those as elements of I dullness see, I see. and drowsiness? That's a good point. Thank you. Yeah, maybe laxity was not such a good choice. Maybe I would call it, okay, heaviness or sluggishness of the mind, that the mind is not so sharp, not so effective, what I call that downward pull of the mind. Okay, so when the mind is sl sluggish, and so that is one of the hindrances, the other, or one aspect of Tina, sluggishness and rigidity. Rigidity in the sense that it's not so effective, not so malleable, not so workable, not so agile. So, so yeah. rigidity and looseness could be the same. In yeah, sense, yeah, unworkable. yeah. Yeah, being unworkable. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, so we go online. So we have. So, was there somebody here with? Oh no, no. Oh. I was going to ask that. Okay, so we have Samantha Jayatilika. Thank, thank you, Vante, for taking my question. Um, I just want to clarify. Uh, so in this suit, the Buddha was um, giving the five reasons for abandoning the hindrances. Would I be correct in saying to enable um, to remember things and the hymns and well have a good memory? Um, I was just wondering why Buddha didn't sort of directly, as I know now, um, say uh, to um, suppress the five hindrances are required to attain um sharper mind ajanas and the purpose being you know to purify the mind and to see reality and these are temporary states and all all that why he didn't give that explanation directly probably my guess would be that because maybe at this point that brahman he's don't forget he's speaking to the brahman the brahman sangharava so probably Sangharava maybe was not yet ready for that kind of teaching. So maybe, you know, the Buddha often speaks to people at their own level. So here he's 
addressing the concerns of the Brahmin. Mm, I see. So would I be correct in saying, Bhante, that Buddha in, in you know, other suttas that I'm not sure of, uh, where it's mentioned, but did advocate um, jhanas in order to sort of like um, purify the mind to see reality is beneficial? Well, of course, as, I, as I've said before, like many suttas, especially those on the full sequential training, include the jhanas within the stages of training. So it's been like a debated point whether the jhanic attainments are really a necessary requirement mm -hmm. for developing insight. And the prevalent opinion of you within the Theravada commentarial tradition is that they are not absolutely essential that one can develop sufficient degree of concentration to develop insight without the attainment of the jhanas. So when, the, when one practices a method, say, of the Satipatthana method, you know, in the Satipatthana Sutta, you don't see mention, explicit mention of the jhanas. Though mindfulness of breathing is included, and mindfulness of breathing is a meditation subject that can lead to the jhanas, but the jhanas are not explicitly mentioned in the Satipatthana Sutta. In fact, even the Satipatthana Sutta includes mindfulness of the five hindrances as one of the practices. Mm, so right. one can use the method of Satipatthana to observe and to overcome the hindrances. Mm. Okay, thank you, Bhante. So it just depends on one's uh, ability to see reality, I suppose. Yeah, it seems that there are different methods according to different, um, different practitioners. Thank you. And one's personalities, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Okay, the next question will be Lucas Cabrera. Okay, thank you, Bante. Are you hearing me? Um, a simple question. When you talk about uh, the translation of a suba to faunus, yeah. uh, the Venerable has said that this translation is not, uh, doesn't feel perfect for you nowadays. So I wonder, it's a term that I have difficulty in translating myself to. Do you have a special a favorite uh, term to translate it nowadays or a choice? choice word for a suba. Thank you. The question is, what, are you asking like, what is the, the best translation of a suba? Yeah, now, nowadays, what would, would you consider right. the best uh, translation? I think I yeah. use now unattractive, the sort of the unattractiveness, with sort of foulness, the word foulness, it seems to suggest like that one has an emotional attitude of aversion towards the body and sometimes it leads then to sort of misrepresentations of buddhism as being having this kind of emotional um negation this negative emotionally negative attitude towards the body so it's not that i would say that the practice is trying to generate an attitude of aversion towards the body but it's a skillful means of weakening and sort of debilitating sensual lust. And so I say that my preferred rendering now is the unattractive nature of the body. Okay, Bente, thank you. It's an honor. Okay, so next we'll take use. Yes, Bente, thank you. Okay. I, I have a question about the, uh, the Jhana Sutta uh, standard quote, which is Vivicheva Kamehi, yeah. Vivicha Akusalehi Kamehi. So you, I, I read explanations. Those two are code words for five hindrances. But another interpretation is they only refer to the first two hindrances. Are you able to clarify, please? I think certainly to enter the jhana, yeah, first the, the meaning Vivicheva Kamehi, Vivicha Akusalehi Damehi. So it means secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome qualities of mind, unwholesome states of mind. I think here we have to see that the five hindrances are intended, all five hindrances. 
So what I say among the five hindrances, the first two, sensual, sensual desire and ill will, are the heavy hindrances, sort of the major obstacles, and the other three are the weaker hindrances, dullness, um, restlessness, and doubt are the weaker hindrances. But when it speaks about to overcome the unwholesome states as the preliminary to enter the jhana, it would have to be the removal of all five hindrances in an active form. Thank you. Okay, next will be, this will have to be the last question. Samangi Munasinga. Yes, Bhante, thank you. Um, I have a um, quick question about, and you said in the last, uh, um, if you have doubts, you can think that it is Mara who's making your mind down, uh, doubtful. What exactly are we supposed to think of as Mara? Is it defilements of our own mind or some other external thing? I'm very confused about that. Yeah, I, I say don't conceptually elaborate too much on, on, <clears throat> on this. Just the main point is when doubts arise during the sitting practice, don't latch on to them and dwell on them and let the mind keep on you know, revolving around the doubts, trying to figure things out during the meditation. But when doubts arise, just take the attitude, I'm going to drop the doubt for now, I will deal with the doubts later out of the when I'm out of the meditation, and just go back to your meditation object, whatever it is. Okay, thank you. Don't have to think too much about depicting the doubt as the work of Mara. I was... What exactly is Mara? Or who exactly is Mara? <laughs> yeah, don't just worry because... about that. You could say Mara is maybe just say the personification of the defilements of the mind. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll have to end for the day, so for the morning. So we will end with three bows. First, I'll do the sharing of the merits, and then we'll do the three bows. The three actual bows. Okay, so we'll share the merits with the devas, the nagas, the other spirits, and with all beings. Akasa ta chabumata teva naga mahidika punyantam nanumoditva chirangra kantu sasanam. Akasa ta chabumata teva naga mahidika punyantam nanumoditva Chirangra kantu desanam. Akasa ta chabumata teva naga mahidika punyantang anumoditva. Chirangra kantu mankaram. Dukha pata chani dukha. Baya pata chani baya. Soka pata chani soka. Kantu sabeti pani no. May those in suffering be free from suffering. May those in fear be free from fear. May those in sorrow be free from sorrow. May all living beings also be thus. Okay, and then we're going to do three bows. And so we have an actual Buddha image here, so I'm going to do it in front of the Buddha image. Okay, thank you all for joining us this morning.
And about to Bante Bodhi. Thank you, Bante. 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 Okay, so I'm going to end now. Okay.